Welcome to Real Estate Coach Uncensored on Inman News, where you'll find the best practices, tools, and technology tips to help you grow your real estate business. Here are your hosts, Bernice Ross and Greg McDaniel. Welcome. I'm Bernice Ross. And my name is Greg McDaniel. And my column this week looks at some best practices from the past that we can tweak for today's COVID-19 environment because our leads are plummeting. You know, we, you know, we can't do open house. We can't do, you know, door knocking. We can't do a lot of face-to-face -face meetings. We can't do face-to-face -face client appreciation. So what can we do? But uh, Greg, I want to begin by something you've mentioned that you did about, you know, you've got this $2 million all cash buyer who's living in, in a, a place that's really, you know, scary that she's in in San Francisco. <laughs> being she wants to get out of that. So what's up with her? And you had some results from, uh, from um, calling these people who had listings. Yeah. So I uh, reached out to, uh, I had the idea to call all of the uh, listing agents of the, uh, of the homes that she, we had made offers on or she had expressed, expressed an interest in. And so I reached out and I had multiple different conversations and the, each of the listing agents actually thanked me for calling them, which I was like, Oh, okay, you're welcome. No problem. I appreciate your time as well. Uh, but then the other day I had uh, one of the agents reach back to me and said, Hey, we may have a, hiccup in the deal and um, give me a ring. Um, so you know what? Uh, we were able to communicate. Uh, now, here's the funny thing about it. Uh, unfortunately, they did work out the, the hiccup. So they're going to move forward with the deal. But in, and this is where my client came in and she wrote to me and she asked me a question because in the agent's text to me, he basically said, you know, Greg, we, we resolved it, um, except for the fact that, you know, I still need an, no contingencies, like a $2 million offer and close in like 10 days, you know, if, if we're going to move forward. And she's like, well, see, why is he trying to sell us again? I mean, does he really think that he, where he's going to get that in this market? I said, I don't know, man. I, I just, I just passed on what he told me, but it goes to the mindset of, of how the, the mindset that needs to be adjusted, I guess, you know, it, well, it's just crazy town. How much over asking was it two or 300,000 over asking? Yeah, at least three, at, at least, least 300,000 over asking with no contingencies and no inspections. And it needed quite a bit of work. Yep. So, you know, one of the big takeaways here, again, if you have clients who have a uh, written multiple, they've been, they lost multiple offers, call back all those listing agents. And also, as I said in the article, double check if there's somebody that was in a multiple offer, maybe even a year ago. And, you know, look on the MLS and look on public records, did that property sell? If your client's still interested, it could be a good time to contact that person. You need to pay attention to, are you in the protection period covered under the listing? Most of those tend to be six months. Is that what it is in your area? That you yeah. know, for, yeah, six months. So if you're over six months out, you can contact that seller directly and get a one party listing on that and show it. So, and um, so that's just something that's, you know, it's a way to get more listings possibly, but certainly to maybe do a deal for somebody who, you know, isn't, you know, was interested a while back. And I think really an important takeaway here, Greg, is something that we were talking about before we jumped on is that as listing agents, you know, we have before, you know, before COVID-19 and now what happens when, you know, we get back, you know, start moving towards, you know, normal, are prices going to be the same? I don't think they are. What's your take on it? I don't think they can be. Um, you know, there are, there's several reasons. I mean, one, we haven't had a lot of comparables. If the comparables are still going to, are going to be there, they're obviously going to be an adjustment in some way, shape or form. I don't know how, what that's going to look like in everyone's neighborhoods, but there has to be some sort of adjustment. I mean, if 300 million people are staying home and, you know, economies are tanking and jobs are being lost or people are being furloughed or, you know, kind of like their hours are being cut. How can a price be demanded if the consumer can't afford it? I, I don't know. I think, well, we, you know, it's just mathematically. It's still supply and demand thing. I mean, you know, yeah. the, you know, the demand is going to be very different. I think when, you know, when, you know, when we get past this, we don't know yet. And that's something we can kind of watch and see. Um, 
I want to go on now to talk about some of the basics. And one of the most fundamental ones is the difference between a lead versus a prospect versus a client. What's your take on that? You know what? I, I think there's another part in there and it, it can be part of a lead, but I think the number, the first part of getting someone to work with you, they are a respondent because uh, they're responding to some sort of outside action. Then that becomes a lead. So if Zillow or Trulia or Realtor.com or who, who knows, your Aunt Bessie who's running at Facebook ads for you, you know, get someone to respond to that outbound lead, like, hey, are you interested in buying or selling? Then that becomes a lead and then the lead is then pushed over to you and then it turns into a prospect and that's the person you're starting to prospect and work and then it turns into a client who you're actively working with. Um, my dad beat it into my head when I was younger. Greg, they're not leads, they're respondents. And <laughs> I've never heard that distinction before, but I, I like that, you know, they've responded, they've responded to your ad so, and when they respond to the ad or if, some, if it comes through someone else, they respond to that other person's ad. It's an interesting distinction. Respond it maybe something that is what they do on Zillow. Then when they get to you, they are a lead. And then right. uh, a prospect is when they express an interest in working with you. You know, you actually get a hold of them and have a conversation. Yeah. And then uh, the takeaway here, and I can't really emphasize this enough, when you first start working with a buyer or seller in today's market or any market, this is just a best practice, have the agency documentation signed at your very first before you do anything with them. Because if there is a commission dispute, and this is, we see people do this all the time to us, you know, they'll run you around showing property, you know, you take these people, and then they'll have their sister-in-law write the offer. Mm -hmm. Now, if you've got the agency documentation and she doesn't, you go to arbitration or even to court, the, you know, court or the arbiters are going to rule based upon who has that agency documentation signed. So this is protecting your commissions, protecting your relationship, especially when you've done a lot of the work. So, you know, that's just a good takeaway. Now, uh, the second thing we wanted to talk about, uh, you know, NAR says that 75%, you know, the latest um, profile of buyers and sellers says that 75% of the sellers hire the first person they meet face to face. Mm. Well, we can't be face to face. So what's our next options, video, email, zoom meetings. Now, Greg, you've got some really interesting stats on, um, some work that, uh, one of the people, you know, Tim Stafford has been doing. What does, what does his research show? I know he said he was working, he was reviewing 60 doctoral studies in this area. So he's got a whole bunch of information that's really interesting. Yeah, Tim, Tim is fascinating. I think we're gonna get him on and do an interview with him because he's just, he's so smart and he's such, a, he's, he's got fascinating stuff to look at. So when it comes to uh, video conversion, um, and, and when I say conversion, that means a like, click, or a share. Uh, that, that, that does not mean they're converting into a lead. I don't want that to be any, ever misunderstood, okay? Uh, but when you do a video, um, you are going to be 75 to 82% a click, like, or share, okay? Um, now, actually, a funny thing about this, Bernice, is I was reading some, uh, some stats last night, <clears throat> and Facebook has, has, has touted to the fact that uh, when you do a live video, it can be live Instagram, live Facebook, live, you know, you pick play YouTube, whatever, um, you did a six X engagement rate. And so it's a substantially larger engagement rate. Um, but if you're sticking with just the static videos that we're talking about, like uploading or whatnot, then when you, when a customer does a video about you, a testimonial or anything else talking about you or your services, there's an 84 to 86% conversion rate. Again, that's a click, like, or share. So it's all, it's literally at like epic levels of how high the engagement rate is when it's done with video. And so that's why I'm going double down, quadruple down, 1 billion down on video. I just think it's just, it, you can't get these returns anywhere else. Well, you know, Greg, and I know so many of us are reluctant to get in front of the screen. You know, we all have kind of screen reluctance and then learn how to do this, you know, and of course a lot of, you know, and then we've got to 
you know, a couple of generations now that they've been doing Facebook Live and, you know, they're, they're doing all this, you know, face to face. You know, those of us who are older, you need to adapt or, you, you know, you're just going to be left out because this uh, pandemic has forced everybody into these venues, whether we like it or not. And I think we're seeing a huge change going forward about that conversation for another day about what that's going to look like. But, uh, you know, it, it, one of the things that strikes me about that, it could be just, you know, a lot more people may decide they need a home office and they don't need to go into the office, <laughs> you know. Exactly. You know, yeah. Yeah, that cuts down on overhead for the employer. I mean, there's all kinds of interesting things that can come about that. Um, there was a study done by um, of over 99,000 emails that was done by a site called superoffice.com. And they had some really interesting findings, Greg. They found, first of all, only 20% of the email programs were responsive. And what that means is do they fit to the size of the screen that they're being looked at? And I think over 60% right now, I don't remember the exact numbers, are viewing you know, their content on mobile devices and especially video content. So you, know, you wanna see how your video email or video, you know, your email looks on your, on your phone, on your um, iPad, on your laptop just to see what it's looking like and how it's appearing. If, you know, if you're having to do the, you know, spread it out and do that, that's a problem. So, you know, you want, you Big know, problem. should just fit automatically. Also, I thought it was interesting, their study looked at when are the best open rates. So if you're going to send something, uh, Monday through Friday is better than Saturday or Sunday. I've seen some research that suggests differently, but this is a recent study. And the best times between noon and six but the peak, and I mean, it looked like this, you know, was, was at around three o'clock. So between 2.30 and 3.30, best time to email. And I don't know if people are just at that, you know, the kids are out of school or, or uh, you know, they're at work, they're at the end of the day, they've got, you know, they need a break, they're looking at what's going on if they're checking their emails in, but that's, you know, that's an important takeaway. In terms of what you send, um, use your name up to your company's name, and then your header, you know, the, the subject field should be more, no more than six to 10 words. And um, Greg and I have been playing with something called a headline analyzer. You just discovered this. This is from the American Marketing Institute. That's AM Institute and then headline analyzer. So AM Institute and headline analyzer. Google that and I'll bring it up. What happened with uh, one of the, you know, the titles, so you had a name of a show or something that you were doing that you, sh you shifted on and made a pretty big difference. Yeah, it was, it was dramatic. I, I, I had done a Instagram IGTV video. Um, and so I'd shot it and I thought it was super awesome title. It was niched down and find your superpower and how to, you know, prospect for leads. And I'm like, oh, that's so cool. Niche down. This is going to get a ton of views. I mean, you, I'm usually around the 12 to 2,000 views per IGTV, I you know, give or take. This thing got like 300 views. I'm like, what in the heck happened? Um, and I went, I plugged in that into this headline analyzer. And it was, it was like out of, uh, I think out of 100, isn't it, Bernice? Mm -hmm. It's a score of 100. Uh, I got 16.65. And I'm like, oh. Bernice, is that good? And you're like, no, Greg, that's not good. <laughs> now, the, uh, what you want is at least uh, in the 30 to 50 range, which is professional copy, you know, copywriters. Like you hire somebody, you paid for them to write your copy if it's between 30 and 50, and you can figure it out just playing with it. And we've got some guidelines mm -hmm. on that. Um, well, the, well, do you know what, when I, when I tweaked it, do you know what my, what, what my score went to? Tell me. 53.85. And what was your new headline? Five things you need to know to niche down and, and find your superpower. And mm -hmm. people are just, they just, they, it went through the roof. It absolutely went through the roof. It, it's really? so, so much fun to play with. So, so you've got the results. So your views jump way up, you know? Oh, hockey stick. Just, I mean. Really? Isn't it was that interesting? So. Fascinating. Check your, check your headlines. There's another, you know, I've been using this thing for years. It does work. And the, uh, the secret that you had was using the number five, mm -hmm. just adding that. Uh, if you use the word secret or awesome, that also, according to the super office study, that works. Things that don't work are the words confirm, features, and upgrade. You know, don't, don't you almost anytime you see that you're, 
when one of the people that you've got, they, you know, I, this happens with half all the time. They want me to upgrade. No, <laughs> no, no upgrade. I'm not going to Catalina. No, <laughs> no, no. Everything is working fine. I'm not fooling around with it. Uh, so in other things, if you use a hashtag or a question mark in your subject line, that also will cause your views to go down. Now, um, I want to go on to talk about, you know, uh, Greg, you've been, you know, you work with the referrals, but you're kind of a hardcore prospector. Uh, when I've trained it, you know, you've heard, you know, we, we, he and I were, Greg and I were talking about the ABCD model and tweaking that for what's happening right now in terms of assessing uh, how strong your clients are in this environment. You know, the ABCD meet, you know, ABCD model from uh, referral stands for A is for angels. These are people who will send you referrals and do so regularly uh, and they will do business with you. B is for those who will do business with you and make a referral if you show them how, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, some people are not comfortable doing referrals because, you know, I remember when my best friend didn't refer, you know, she didn't list with me and she says, I don't want to lose our friendship over my husband. <laughs> <laughs> And that was the God's truth. <laughs> That's funny. And then um, C's will not refer, but they will do business with you. And then D's are delete. Now, you have tweaked this model for what's happening today. And you're using it as kind of a litmus test to judge how strong these people are as buyers or sellers in this environment we're in right now. So... Tell me a little bit more about what you did on this. So it's it's not only just a litmus test of the of the of the of the leads or the prospects. It's also the source of the prospect. Um, you know, you're looking at you know, did you get them from a large source? And I'm just going to use Zillow because it's the big ten thousand pound gorilla. Okay, um, let's just say you get Zillow leads. Um, or is it better that you get like, if you're going to go out and shoot some videos and you get organic people to come and contact you and follow back up with you and they engage with you from your own, you know, sourcing of time and energy and knowledge, or is it your network or is it your past clients? I mean, where are, what's the source of the lead? And then you can analyze, okay, well, I can take more money and put it over here or, or more over there or just eliminate that whole sort, that whole line of you know, marketing because it's just not giving me quality leads. Because we guys, let's be honest, you don't want quantity. You want quality. You know, I don't want a hundred leads. I don't want a thousand leads a month. I don't want to brag about that because I have to do all of that follow-up and you got to sift. It's like mining for gold. You're going to sift through a lot of rocks and dirt to find that one nugget. Why don't you just take a, a handful of nuggets and just work with those nuggets? I, 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 that's my personal thing. So that's what I'm using as a litmus test here. One, how, what are my lead sources looking like? Are they viable to continue in the future? And two, what are the quality of leads coming out of them and then putting them in the appropriate buckets on how to follow up and when to take action with them? Because your A's are going to be the people, even if, you know, the homeowner has, you know, COVID, it's going to still be like, get me in that house. I want to go see a property. And now, should you do that? No, it's not healthy. But what I'm saying is, in this in the story, is they're actively moving at all times, and they want to buy or sell. And as Bernice held up the phone, you could do you could have the homeowner do a video tour. So, just active, active, active is my A's, and that's the source I would I would I would niche down on and go double deep. What a percentage of uh, of people that you've been working with are in that? category have you seen a big drop you know are your a's still kind of hanging in there for the most part or have they dropped dropped down it's, somewhat it's funny like the people that are truly wanting to sell like they made that mental shift and they're like okay we're taking action let's take action oh no corona just struck now what are we going to do uh, but if, I mean, these people, when I'm doing my calls, um, I'm using uh, Red X's triple line dialer and I'm, I'm, they, I just brought out some new uh, algorithm with their expireds and these people really want to sell. I mean, I mean, they will take action. So I, I don't, I don't see a, I don't see a reduction. I just see a pause because of the health concerns. But I'm telling you, man, this, when, this, when the gates go up and we're let out, it's going to be like a, a herd of just a stampede of people buying and selling. It's going to be 
Hopefully great. I believe that's, you know, I think the demand hasn't gone down, but, you know, we talked about some of the other things in terms of jobs and businesses. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we may see a pretty major change in terms of our clients. Now, what about your bees? Um, you know, how would you, you know, how do you rank them? So they're going to buy and sell, but, you know, they're willing to wait. Um, they're, they're like, Greg, you know, I like it. It's just, yeah, it's not the most perfect time for me. So I'm going to hold off. So our A's, you know, come, no, nothing's going to stop them from buying or selling right now if, if, the, if the other side will play ball with them. B's are going to be, eh, we're going to pump the brakes, you know, and then C is just going to be like, you know what, we're going to hold off for quite a while, follow up with us every six months. And then D's are the ones that are like, just forget it, man. We, just, we tried to get our price. We didn't get our price or we tried to buy in this area. We couldn't afford this area. Or there's nothing for sale. We're just not going to do anything for, for six months to a year. So and those, I, and then those are, and by the way, those are also the people that you should have delayed it to begin with that are sitting there in your database that you may have been mailing to for two or three years or five years or 10 years. And they haven't, we've got somebody who's been mailing to us for 15 years. And you know what? That's funny you mentioned that. Uh, I went through with uh, viral marketing and my coach the other day, and we we had about 15,000 people in my database. We chopped it down to, I think, 3,600 or 3,200 or something like that. Because uh, these are the people all dead wood. They've never responded to anything. They were, they were leads and prospects. They just were not engaging anymore, right? So they're viable. We thought it was great to have a 15,000 person database, but guess what? My engagement rate, <laughs> literally through the roof once you get down and you have be able to have good conversations with people. So uh, Brittany, what's your thoughts on, on reducing databases? Do well, you think first it's a of all, thing? I'm a big thing, a big, big believer in that. And let me share something from coaching. There is, uh, we've talked about this before, the vacation phenomenon. <laughs> <laughs> oh. You were going on this big trip, you know, you were going on this big trip before the COVID-19, you know, all through Asia and, you know, really wonderful oh. trip all before this hit. But just before you're, get, you're about getting ready to leave, all this business starts rolling in. And what happens is, is when you create space in your, you know, uh, when you create space in your business, like taking a vacation, there's room for new business to come in. So one of the things while you're sitting at home to create more space in your business, clean your closet, clean your garage, clean your database, get rid of the dead wood. What you're doing is you're making room for more new business to come in. You're not carrying, you know, you were carrying what? 3,600 out of what, 15,000? You had, you know, what, uh, 11,600, 400, whatever it was. We just, had. Yeah. A, a huge percentage of all that dead wood, it's gone. Now you've got room in your database for a lot more really good leads. Yep. So, uh, you know, take a look at where you're, you know, if you're mailing, you're spending probably 50 to a dollar a person every time you mail, 50 cents to a dollar. You know, how many, you know, if they're not responding, dump them. Yeah, guys, dump them. It, it, it doesn't. It's not a hit on you to get rid of them. It's actually a good thing. It's like it's like out with the old, in with the new. I was actually doing some search the other day, you know, last night, Bernice, and I was researching on Facebook. I need to do more about it. But I, how do I get rid of all the friends, fr friends, uh, Facebook friends that have never responded to anything that I've ever put out there? I mean, I wonder if there's a way to do that because you got to purge so you can go then bring in the new people and have a better engagement rate and have a better conversation, a better opportunity to build business and build relationships. It goes across the board on all databases, all sources of, of, of when you collect any kind of human interaction. You know what I mean? Well, I think one way that you can certainly screen is by uh, doing, looking at people who have followed you. That's a higher level of commitment in general than someone who's just, you know, been a friend. Mm. And again, it's, uh, are these people, are are these people who have friended you, are they people that are going to send you referrals or do business with you? And that's one of the ways to kind of engage, but then you've got a lot of personal people in there too. So it's like, um, one of the ways I would suggest is making a Facebook list and, you know, it could be, okay, okay. close friends, it could be family. It's like starting to categorize those lists on Facebook. And then that gives you a way to actually start to, you know, to segment that database. But that thing's kind of a mess for most of us over there. It, it is. And you know, Bernice, you brought up a really good idea. I might go off on a tangent here. 
Uh, so I probably will bring this up in another article, but there's some ways to go through that. And you make, you just got my mind working in regards to how to clean out the database, but yet still get a higher level of engagement and interaction from everyone that you have the opportunity to connect, connect with. Because once you do that, the algorithm of Facebook says, oh, these two are talking. This must be an important person to this other person. So yeah, the thing of it is to engage and to raise your engagement rate when someone that that you've done business with or you know part of your sphere makes a comment on Facebook, respond to their comment. Don't dislike, post something because that raises your profile on Facebook. And also, if anybody else makes a post on the same one, engage with their post. That's a way to expand your database on Facebook with someone mm -hmm. you actually had a conversation with. So um, the final thing, you know, kind of shifting gears from Facebook and from ABCD. Um, the last one I wanted to talk about is open house. And um, when we were in previous downturns, one of the things they, um, they used to have the foreclosure buses. Do you remember that, Greg? Where there were oh, yeah. Around, like, all the foreclosures in one subdivision, especially if, you know, it's a, you know, a, you know, oh, yeah. you know, build, you know, where a bunch of builders are, you go to, you know, or they'd have, um, you'd have, uh, I was working in, you know, uh, LA, so we didn't have a lot of new construction, certainly no new subdivisions to speak of, very few of them, but, uh, well, you know, we, you know, there might be um, seven or eight of us that had listings in Westwood in a certain price range where we would get together and we'd do an open house. It, all of our listings were open that Sunday and we're different brokerages, but we all promoted it. And then, you know, we got traffic coming in. We advertised it on each of our companies. And so we got a lot of traffic coming in um, and that worked really well. So, and you could, you know, people could go to the other open houses, but it was a way for everybody to see some, you know, an area when there's you know, not a whole lot of sales, but at least get you, you know, that exposure out there for your sellers and get more people in coming in from not only your advertising, but other people's. Now, the other thing, of course, is to, do a virtual open house. In fact, you had a story about that that you saw just a few days ago. Uh, about doing virtual open houses? Mm -hmm. um, well, there's a couple of them, um, you know, and one of the things when it comes to, to doing virtual open houses, um, it, it, you don't, it, well, this one kind of scared me and that's why I'm stuttering over my words, you know, because I was going to look at a house, right? I had my client with me and I walk in and all of a sudden there's this other person in this house. I'm like, uh, you're not supposed to be here. What's going on? And it was the agent doing a video um, and then they were going to host a virtual open house on Zoom. So, so anyone who wanted to come in and take a look at the house, they said, okay, I'm going to do it at this, this, and this time, walk through the property, show it off, answer any questions. Um, in, the re in retrospect, looking back at it, I'm kind of baffled that why they just didn't shoot that video once and then air it three more times, you know? I, I, that's the one I don't understand. But I mean, I went out and got myself this little guy. This, this is the DJI uh, Gimbal 3. Very cool, about 120 bucks or so. But it's a stabiliz stabilizer. And what this thing can do is you can screw into the very bottom into a tripod here. And then you can activate the, the, the app and it will do facial tracking. So you can sit it on a tripod and then it will just follow you as you walk and talk about different aspects of the house as it sits on a tripod side subject but very cool could be very cool for tri open houses well th this is uh very interesting that is something you know part of the problem you know the the newer iphones i don't know if it's in, if the 10 7 i know the 11s do they have the stabilizers built in for but most of us are running phones that are not that new mm -hmm. uh, you know, they, you know, they, somebody was suggesting grow, GoPro last week, that really takes care of it. But if you can, you know, this, this tool, way cheaper than buying a new phone. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, you, this is a, I saw the DJI mobile, you know, Gimbal 3, that way smaller, more compact than the Gimbal 2. Um, and then I, I'm running the iPhone 11. So I'm doubling down in stabilization. Uh, so this, the cinematic smooth shots, because if, if nobody wants to, uh, as you're walking yeah, if you're holding it, you're going to shake. <laughs> yeah. It just, it, it, it's something in, in new and fun and, you know, people really take interest in it and you can have a, well, anyways, don't, don't get me down my, my tech, my tech bubble here. Um, <laughs> Sounds like a, a conversation for another day. So to wrap up for today, a final takeaway, Greg. 
Um, final takeaway, guys, go through your database, do some spring cleaning, um, get it up to snuff. Uh, there's nothing wrong about how, you know, making, bringing your database down a little bit. Uh, and it's also an op really great opportunity not to make calls to people for sales, but we're like, Hey, how's life? You know, how are you feeling? Do you need any toilet paper? Do you need any paper towels? Do you, do you, do you, do you have you had an adult conversation lately? Because I know the kids are at home. You want to talk for 20 minutes? You know, how's the, how's the husband? How's the wife? You know, just you, like I told you before, I had a friend of mine from Denver, Colorado call me and he's the only one that's called me and just said, Hey man, how are you doing, bro? And I think our clients are, are starved for that. So go clean the database out have human to human you know, conversations. And uh, when you come out of this thing, you'll be blown out the back end at 2000 miles an hour, ready to rock and roll and take, take back the marketplace. What's your total takeaway? And for me, it's just, again, don't forget about the basics, you know, uh, get your, uh, get your agency document, documentation signed, you know, get focused on getting face to face via zoom or on video. Those are just, you know, that's the name of the game right now. And if, it always has been. It's just a different venue. Thank you for being with us today, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for joining us for Real Estate Coach Uncensored on Inman News. Be sure to tune in for our next show when we'll be back to share even more ways you can grow your real estate business. For the latest news and analysis, check out the other great stories today on Inman News.